Hello, my name is Annie Gibson. I am the director of the Office of Study Abroad at Tulane University. And today's presentation is going to go over the process for approval, proposing and approving a faculty-led short-term program abroad. This um, is especially for faculty. However, this is also relevant for short-term programming abroad that needs to go through an advanced vetting process. So with that, let us begin. So what we look for in faculty-led proposals is that there is a desire and consistency in teaching uh, a course abroad that addresses both academic content and why this course is relevant to the broad location, as well as oversight in logistics and management of study abroad. Faculty-led programs are very popular amongst Tulane students, yet they do require faculty being very engaged in uh, explaining to students the benefits of the program as well as why and where the program will be located. Students are very interested to travel with faculty. It provides the opportunity to have close contact with faculty uh, in terms of making contacts for letters of recommendation, in terms of deepening course knowledge and showing its relevance in real world scenarios. Students also to go on faculty-led programs with interest in a particular course. The on-site components and the experiential learning in the particular course are very important. Students also at Tulane tend to choose courses that satisfy particular requirements, that be they major or minor requirements or core curriculum requirements. And this is even true for decision-making around study abroad. So, a good practice in your proposals is often to include, if there are multiple courses, at least one or two that may satisfy particular major or minor requirements and think about crafting those courses as well as the advertising to, to target that particular group of students. And then finally, students are interested to sort of deepen their, their, their knowledge of the world and so thinking strategically about how your program also engages with local culture is very important. So if you're teaching a physics class, why are you teaching that physics class on location? How does it differ from, from teaching it on at, <clears throat> at Tulane's campus? So now I'm gonna talk to you about the steps for proposing a program to Tulane. It is a lengthy process to go through. And I want to give you a few tips about what will make a strong proposal, the, these steps that you'll have to go through and the different resources that you have available along the way. First, what goes into a proposal? For if you have not yet taken a look at a study abroad proposal form, it's available on the Office of Study Abroad website, just where you found this video. And Within that proposal, you're gonna to have to fill out the application form and in it, you're gonna have a, a series of signatures and approvals for different administrative offices. You're going to need to have crafted your course descriptions and at least draft syllabi for all the courses that you'll be teaching. You'll need a daily program itinerary describing your activities for each day of the trip and the academic goals for those activities. Now, this can vary because you're often doing a proposal almost a year prior to when you go abroad. And so we realize that there'll be tweaks. There may be days that you'll shift in order to accommodate what is available for your on the ground experiential learning, but the, the content should remain pretty consistent. And then finally, you're gonna need a detailed budget and, and to designate the, the office and the manager for the financial operations of your program. I am the main point of contact for helping you through this proposal process. So I encourage you, if you've not already been in touch with me to reach out below is my email address, a gibson3 at tulane.edu. And I'm happy to brainstorm your proposal a bit and give you ideas along the way. 
So in your proposal, the following um, signatures will be required. So you'll be you'll be making meetings and making sure that people are aware of your program and its development. Your department chair for all courses that are going to be taught needs to be aware. The curriculum committee, if you're teaching any new courses, the dean, the provost working group, and the study abroad approval, uh, study abroad committee approval. And I'm going to walk through what each of these um, stages we'll, we'll be looking for. So the first is your, your consultation with your department chair. Your department chair is going to look at the courses that you're proposing and is going to see if those are courses that they um, are in favor of you teaching abroad. And this, this is a must, you must have these, these proposals. So um, Ideally, they'll be satisfying a major or minor or core curriculum requirements. And your chair, it, it's helpful to submit a sort of a concept memo. So the, the summary of the courses and the programming, the number of participants you are um, thinking of, the dates that you're planning to go, um, the financial viability, just that you've had, you're starting to think about these um, things. But really, the main goal of the department chair is to decide if these courses are courses that can be taught abroad. So there could be conflicts on this. For example, there might be a lower level language course that the department decides they would prefer taught on campus or a lab course where the department would prefers it be taught on campus. So you must be sure to get the, the approval of the department prior to um, moving too far ahead to make sure that those courses are viable. If you have any new courses that you are proposing, you're going to need the approval of the curriculum committee. So this is just as you would propose a new course for the Tulane catalog, any new courses um, may must go through. If it's a special topics course, if you your department may give you one year or two years um, depending to before it has to officially go through the, the committee as a regular offering. But if this is a program that you're going to teach on a regular basis, and this is a course that will be taught on a recurring basis, um, all courses will need to go through the curriculum committee. Then the dean needs to approve. So the, the approval of the dean is um, We'll, over, we'll see that you will take a look at your program proposal. We'll see that you have the, uh, the, the approval of your chair to teach these courses. And the other important piece that the Dean will see is um, they will review the managing office. They will, what, is this course, who, who is managing the finances of this program? Who is connect, collecting the, the, the student uh, tuition and the student programming fee, who is um, processing receipts. So what the Dean's office of that managing office needs to sign off that, that this program, um, that they're aware of this program and that they will be um, overseeing the budget and the costs. And, um, and, the, and the Dean will also do a, a, a review, their, their basic review that, that the, the the program seems viable to them. Um, so that's the Dean. Next, the Provost Working Group. The Provost Working Group is the Tulane entity that oversees Tulane risk management and legal responsibilities. So they are going to review all of your contracts, all of your legal contracts with any third party providers, with any transportation companies, um, with any housing organizations, any safety concerns, so they'll do a, an analysis of the location where you are um, studying. And so all of those considerations will be taken into account. And the application form is going to walk you through some of the things that you will need to provide to the working group so that they're able to evaluate the, the, your, your program. And the study abroad committee, which is the final approval once you have gone through this. And the Tulane study abroad committee evaluates the likelihood of a program's success. So they're, they're taking a lot of things into consideration. 
They are constantly reviewing the Office of Study Abroad's portfolio. So they're um, looking for academic relevance of your program. They're looking at the cost of your program to see that it's in line with other faculty-led programs. They're looking at how many students you would need to be able to run. Um, any create, coming with suggestions on how to how to make your program more um, engaging for for students and any conflicts that there might exist. So if you're developing a program in Rome and you the, the faculty committee may say, you know, in fact, we have two faculty led programs already in Rome um, there. And, and so they may provide guidance on whether this is a good idea or how you're competing with other programs and so ways in which you might tailor course offerings or things like that. Um, so the other thing is that the Office of Study Abroad is dedicated to increasing diversity in study abroad. So thinking about how the program is designed for equity, thinking about how courses are designed for equity, thinking about ways in which students are connected to their local environments and whether that is following in line with best practices for study abroad. And um, it, the study abroad committee in general is, is providing a, um, a role of, of guidance and so, and helping you strengthen a program. Once you've gotten these stages one through four, uh, your, your program is, is pretty well approved. And then the study abroad committee is likely their changes are, are, are tweaking in order to enhance the academic performance or in, in order to enhance the marketability of your program across institutions and also to suggest coll collaborations across schools. So <clears throat> that's an overview of the, the final, those kind of swing of approvals that you'll need. Now I'm gonna get you in the kind of the nitty gritty of the program application. And uh, these are the things that you'll need to, to keep in mind as you fill out that application. First of all, it, it's important to think about all the different people that you'll be collaborating with on this program. So the structure of a faculty-led program is not simply a faculty member taking a group of students abroad. There are many more roles and people involved in a successful faculty-led program. So I'm going to go through the responsibilities of those first of all. So you have trip leaders, you have supporting faculty, you have third-party providers or contractors, you're on the ground support, you have someone managing the program, you likely have on-site staff. They might be Tulane staff or they might be on-site staff that you've contracted. And then you have the Office of Study Abroad, either as your principal managing office or as in a sort of a consultancy role for you. So I'm gonna go through each of these. So the program leader. The program leader, one person is, is designated to be the main point of contact for the program. This is for emergencies. This is for setup. This is for questions regarding uh, health and safety. This is for uh, passing along important information from the office of the dean or for the office of the provost around changes in travel um, and design and development of the program. So the role is really a 24 seven role. It begins in the pre-departure stage, working closely with the program manager, working closely with your developing office and building relationships with the students along the way. Here's on the screen, a list of a few of the things that you would be leading as a program leader. And I would like to highlight that program leaders are the first responders in case of an emergency. So that's a 24 seven, on call duty while in country. That can be broken up among supporting faculty, but the program, it's the program leader's responsibility to sort of designate who has the, the emergency phone. And also in coordinating the, the support for emergencies. So if a student needs to be go, to go to the hospital, needs translation, is that directly with the faculty or are you working with on the ground staff? The supporting faculty, the supporting faculty are just as integral to a successful program 
and they are constantly responding and collaborating with the program leaders on all aspects of administration. Their <clears throat> main um, responsibility is teaching their courses, but they are also actively engaged in all co-curricular programming, coordinating uh, crisis management plans. As I mentioned, the, each program will come up with their kind of 24 seven um, responsibility. So it may be that supporting faculty play a role in being the primary emergency contact for portions of the program as well. Um, and having a good team of a strong lead and a support is, is really crucial on, on these programs because the more sort of engagement that you have with students outside of the classroom, <laughs> you'll see that the, the programs are the most successful. The students are really learning a lot in the out of class experiences. And um, we highly suggest as well that all programs work with some third party provider that is local in country. So this could be a study abroad third party provider. The Office of Study Abroad can recommend many in country through our, our, our network of, of study abroad providers. Um, or organizations and or it could also be different travel agencies or vendors transportation vendors travel agencies for short term trips and they will assist with itineraries and coordination of space and classrooms help with pickups and help lead and and become co-educators along the program. And we do really encourage faculty to work closely with third party provider staff on site because the, the, that, that sort of interaction is, is very fruitful. And in terms of the logistics and setup for, for creating your emergency plan and your risk management plan, which is part of this application, this, this role is really crucial for all proposals. So with the contracts between third party providers, in order for it to have a successful proposal, you need to clearly establish contract but in contract or in an MOU, a memorandum of understanding, all agreements in writing that you have with the, with the third party provider. So it should explain what liability they, the third party is assuming and what liability Tulane has, the services that they'll be offering, if the insurance that's being provided, if any, um, any indemnification and choice of law and jurisdiction. All of this is going to be reviewed by the office of the provost prior to school signature. And the third party provider will submit an invoice to be paid by Tulane. By, if you're working with OSA, if Office of Study Abroad is your managing office, then it is paid by Office of Study Abroad or the appointed program manager. So if you've decided to run your program through your department or through another school, they will be responsible for paying that third party provider. The program manager. So someone at Tulane, a, an office at Tulane will need to be appointed as the point program for the development of the program. And you should work very closely with your program manager through the, the proposal process. This is the person that is going to help you develop your program budget. It's going to help you oversee recruitment and administrative needs once your program is on the ground. They are your primary enrollment, uh, liaison in terms of enrollment. They will help you get the, your students registered into courses and they will help you manage getting your program within our Tulane's risk management software called Teradata. So all students and applications must be run through this particular software and your, your program manager will help you do that. So if you're working with the Office of Study Abroad, we take this, we have this piece covered. You'll work closely with us throughout the process. If you are not working with the other Office of Study Abroad and you're using a, your program manager from your own office, then you need to be sure that this person is looped into proper trainings with the Office of Study Abroad in order for them to successfully manage the budget and to successfully manage the requirements for international travel policy and, um, and risk and liability. This is really, really important. 
on-site staff. So with on, on-site, you may contract staff that are in-country. You may decide to bring someone from, a staff member from Tulane with you, and your managing office will help you decide what makes the most sense for your program. Um, the, if you are working with the Office of Study Abroad, a staff member usually accompanies the, the programs and also does intercultural activities in the on-site uh, orientations and in on, on-site in, uh, on different site visits. And they also are the, the primary point of responsibility for working with, um, with manage, helping you manage your budgets while you're abroad. And again, working with the Office of Study Abroad helps you manage many of these logistics pieces. So I highly encourage you to select the Office of Study Abroad as your managing office. However, there are also other offices on campus with a lot of experience in, in study abroad, or perhaps you're interested in expanding your office's capacity for this. And we highly encourage that. The Office of Study Abroad can work as a consultant for your office. Um, but be sure that you are being looped into the travel policies uh, and that your, whoever your program manager is, is working very closely with the Office of Study Abroad if it is not the Office of Study Abroad themselves. The um, other thing to remember is that the managing officer will look over your, help you with your evaluation process and will also help you with the, will be one of your points of contact for your emergency plan when you create that. Um, and so that person will be communicating as well with the provost working group that is vetting sort of the, the health and safety of this program. So that's important to keep in mind. How do you select on-site partners? So first of all, um, on the screen, you'll see a list of potential partners. The most common is to work with, with study abroad providers, with organizations that are specialists in designing student programs abroad. And this helps offload a lot of faculty responsibility in terms of managing logistics and allows you to really focus on the academic components of your class, of your courses and of the overall program. So um, we highly encourage working with third party study abroad providers. There are also universities working directly with uh, foreign offices that often have the ability to um, manage these components of a program, provide housing and things like that. Um, if you're working with these kind of local travel agents or universities, be sure that they're covering the, the amount of, of risk and liability that is as needed for Tulane. Because if they, what is not kind of um, off put to these third party providers means that you will be responsible for that. So it may be that, um, you'll have to write a longer emergency plan, or you may have to uh, work harder to um, explain the, um, the transportation from one place to, to the next, because you'll have to go through kind of a, a more lengthy process of, of evaluation in terms of your, the health and safety of the program. And again, we're happy to help you um, in pretty much any country locate what would be some qualified partners for the type of, of program that you're interested in running. Faculty often do site visits prior to programs. Logistically, sometimes that's not in the budget. You may not have that in your, in your funding capacity to be able to do a site visit a year prior. Uh, so it's definitely not needed. The other option would be though, if you're unfamiliar with your location, is would be to arrive prior to to your um, arrival on site with the students so that you can orient yourself to, to your location. One of the things that we will look for is that the, the faculty or the, 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 the staff that they're working with have experience in country. The next piece of, of your, your application is around budgeting and finances. And so this, this portion is very important to loop in your program manager. So I, if you are working with a program manager outside of Office of Study Abroad, 
I encourage you to share this webinar with them as well so that they can go through these logistics around budgeting. Short-term programs must consider the, the different costs. And so a successful budget is very important both for faculty to understand how they're expected to manage money abroad, which is through the concur system, and also the realistic, um, a realistic budget for the number of students on program. A budget will look and be divided into two parts. One are fixed costs and one are variable costs. The tuition for the program is going to be set by the school. So if you work with, in, with Office of Study Abroad, NTC will set the, uh, the, the cost of the, the tuition for the students. If you work with another um, school, potentially another school will set the cost of tuition. And these costs are similar to, to costs in summer school, though very slightly given that, that the, the costs, the, we, you all, students also have a program cost, which is more variable and will, will also include their, their housing and things like that. We have a draft bed budget sheet at the Office of Study Abroad if needed. Uh, the Office of Study Abroad has scholarship funding available <laughs> for need-based summer scholarships. In order for students to be considered for these, your program needs to, to follow up with the deadlines for the Office of Study Abroad because those are when the, the programs are reviewed and when students are allotted funding. So um, be sure that you're keeping this in mind if you're not working directly with the Office of Study Abroad as, as your program manager, that you're following in line with the deadlines for the Office of Study Abroad and that you are your program is in Teradata if you want your students to be considered for need-based scholarships. The program fee. So the budget, as you say, we have a two line of tuition. And then the program fee, the, the program fee could include many things. On some programs, a flight will be included, on others, it won't. Uh, it, the program fee always includes the housing, the meals, and in, in country transportation. And when you are creating your sort of advertisement for students, it's very important to outline what's included in the, pro, in the program fee so they are aware of any outside costs. They, the, the fee also does not, you're, a few things to note, any time that you are buying meals, alcohol is not permitted on uh, Tulane programs. So your, your funding um, for meals that you're scheduling cannot in include alcohol. The program fee can also not cover any accompanying guests for faculty leads. So if there are any increase in costs, if, you have to, if you're bringing your family and you have to get a larger apartment in order to ac accommodate, those fees are not, cannot be passed along to students in their program fee. Um, students should also be aware that, um, that visas, that, uh, that health exams, that laundry, et cetera, may also not be covered in the program fee. So those could be some, some of the other fees on top of what is covered in the program that the students should be made aware of. How do you register students in bill? So the program manager of your program will register students. Faculty will provide a list, or if it's not the faculty, it might be your ma managing office. So if, it, if it's Office of Study Abroad, we take all of these tasks on, we provide, we will provide the list of students in each course based on their applications and we will get them registered and create the Canvas site. Uh, and we will also bill students. Um, if working with your managing office to figure out these logistics is important. So if you're not working with the Office of Study Abroad, make sure that they are looped into the Office of Study Abroad so they're understanding the process. Um, <clears throat> Fixed costs, again, to think about as you're building a budget, your faculty salaries, of course, housing and meals for faculty and staff, marketing costs, and any classroom space that you may need are fixed. Variable costs are, as listed here, um, 
transportation that may change, um, the classroom supplies you may or may not need, excursions, student cell phones, things that may vary depending on the number of students or the number of needed slots. And we always recommend that your budget includes a contingency. So when you find your estimated number of students, you should have a surplus of about 4% at least of the total program cost. And um, it's also important to note that you will, you will likely have a, at least a little attrition of students. So if your ideal is to have 20 students on program, it's good to, to at least have 22 that you're accepting because it, it is possible that, that two, perhaps more, are not able to come because of finances or grandma gets sick or uh, things like that. And when we evaluate these budgets, all of these things will need to be cl clearly noted so that we can decide whether or not your program is able to operate, whether it is uh, financially uh, po possible for your program to run and to get that final target enrollment. A couple other things to think about with enrollment. If you are working with Newcomb Tulane College, they require that you have eight students to one faculty member per program and five students to one faculty member for course. So think about that when you're targeting enrollment. Make sure that you are uh, getting enough students to, for, for your program. And also in terms of, of risk management, you will always want at least two people on a program. So if you're going as one faculty member, then you need to clearly outline who is your on the ground support that's with the, with the program at all times so that there's at least two people that are on program. With you're working with when you're working with the Office of Study Abroad, a staff member is budgeted into your uh, program. If you're if you're if you decide later that you want to invite a TA or some sort of teaching assistant, that is all the responsibility of the faculty member and is not covered under the budget. And um, for OSA programs, 20 students is a is kind of a golden number on most programs. That's what we ideally are looking for in terms of your budget ratio that your program would be able to run with 20 students. We do have exceptions to this where we'll we have, for example, we'll take a larger number of faculty members, more courses are taught on program, but that does mean an increase in the number of students in order for the program to run. So for when you, if there's two faculty members, two to three faculty members going, and students are required to take two courses on site, you're looking for about 20 students for, for two to three faculty members to be able to, to hit your, your budgetary needs in most locations once you kind of have developed your budget. Keep exchange rates in mind. Make sure that your program manager's ex understanding of exchange rates and also the potential fluctuations between one year to the next when you estimate budget that exchange rates can, can change things and, and pad, your, pad your budget accordingly. Also think about your cancellation fees. So if, if you're working with the Office of Study Abroad, we have a, a $300 confirmation deposit that's due after they've been accepted. And this is a way of confirming that they're going on the program. It becomes part of the program fee. So they're not, they're not actually paying um, on top of what their program fee is, but it is a way of ensuring that we know that those students are planning to go on the program. And you can online see our summer cancellation policy as well. Okay, so those are the stages of kind of the things that you'll have to work on to get your proposal uh, approved. And I just want to briefly mention, once you have been approved, the, the next stages of the program that you have moving forward. We have other um, webinars and work that we do with faculty that really work through the next stages. But once your program is, is approved, your recruitment, um, the time becomes for recruitment. 
This is when you're attracting students. This is this happens about a year out. So if you're planning to run a, a, a summer program, you want to have your proposal approved the summer prior so that you can get your program into our software where get your application in the system so that the fall prior to the summer that you want to go student you're advertising for the the program um, you, there's a lot of outreach especially when you have a new program to to that had doesn't yet have student word of mouth that you need to to tap into uh, so through the department through social media Faculty are the best advertisers of programs when they are engaged in it. So through classroom visits, students respond very well to being sent summer um, study abroad information directly from a faculty member. Once students are accepted, um, the student, you'll, go, you'll work with faculty leaders to kind of go through, figure out what students are accepted, what students, um, any sort of health and safety or planning uh, that needs to happen. You'll work on pre-departures. You'll have two pre-departures that are mandatory prior to, to leaving Tulane's campus. And this stage is very important for, for retention because this is the stage when, when program deposits are being finalized and put down. And so keeping students looped in, explaining and getting them excited about the program is very important. Then you'll have obviously the dates of your time in country with students and then your re-entry. This, this is a piece that we, we see that faculty sometimes um, miss and it's a missed opportunity to bring students together after the conclusion of the summer program in the fall to, for continued reflection. The it, data shows that the learning from study abroad lasts way beyond the actual time and country. And in fact, this re-entry stage and doing further reflection is really crucial to, to um, ingraining learning in students. So we encourage faculty to continue to figure out ways to loop students in um, after they return. And so that's important. Those are the stages. Um, there's you'll have to come up with your emergency protocols and crisis management plan um, and have this on file with us at all time. And this is your tree of who, who to call if something is to happen on site. These are important contact numbers to include in your, <coughs> in your emergency plan. If you're working with the Office of Study Abroad, we'll help you design this. If you're working with another program, then you'll need to decide what your emergency plan is and put this on file. And, <coughs> excuse me, should you have any further questions, please, <coughs> please feel free to contact me. <coughs> thank, you. Ooh, thank you very much. <coughs>